Kathy, I am going to have you get started. If you are not aware, um, Laetra is our in-house legal counsel. She has a lot of fancy titles. She's like chief operating officer. She's much smarter than me, cuter than me, and is gonna be your instructor today for, this course is called Risky Business. If you are filling out your CE, please be sure that's the class that you check on the form. If you have questions, please drop those in chat. I will be monitoring that as we go through the class and ask those as we have time. Please be sure that you are on mute. And if you are receiving credit, you must stay on camera for the duration of the course. Thank you all for being here. All right, and Nicole's gonna proctor our slides for us. So I appreciate that. Um, Nicole, if you wanna go ahead and pull those up. All right, so what we're gonna talk about today, we're, we're gonna talk about the new contract changes for sure, um, but we're also gonna talk about how you guys as real estate agents protect yourselves from all of the hiccups that can happen when we've got uh, issues with contracts. And some of these are kind of sneaky. Um, some of them you may never run into in your career, or some of them you might think, ooh, I've done that, and nobody needs to raise their hand and tell on yourselves, but we'll talk about ways that you can protect yourself going through them. To do that, we're just gonna talk through every paragraph on the contract um, and kind of go through where I see pitfalls happening. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. All right, so um, first part of the contract deals with the parties that are gonna be in the contract. And that seems like it's simple enough and a very straightforward thing. And most of your contracts it is, but something that you guys need to be aware of as agents deals with what I call point of discovery. So at any given time in a transaction, you guys have relied on a ton of information that's been provided to you by your clients, specifically on the seller side. And that's what you use to market the property, that's what you use to sell the property, and then ultimately to go under contract. Let's pretend that this particular um, contract has Jennifer Smith in as your sellers. You guys turn the contract into us, we issue the title commitment back, and when that title commitment comes back, you see that our title vested actually has three people listed. So that's what is what I refer to as point of discovery. That's the first opportunity that you have to find out based on the information you've relied on from your client thus far, that there might be an issue. If your title vested doesn't match the sellers on your contract, you've got people in title that aren't on your contract, which actually that means you don't have a valid mining contract anymore because you haven't had all the parties that own the property execute that contract. Ways where this can come up it can happen when there's been a divorce in the chain of title. It can happen when there are deceased people in the chain of title. If your clients ever filed for bankruptcy, they may not be the group that's allowed to, to sell the property anymore. And up until this point, you've had no warning really. You know, you guys aren't title experts. You're not expected to go down to the county and research who owns the property. You rely on a lot of um, information from your client and the representations that they make and so at this point, you're surprised. Um, what tends to happen, and this is where I see agents get themselves in trouble, is you guys will call us on the title company side and we'll say, oh yeah, somebody died in the chain of title. We need to do affidavits of airship. And you go, okay, sounds good. <laughs> Hang up and go on about your transaction. Um, what has to happen or what should happen on your side as the agent is to turn around and do some disclosure and some conversation with the other side of the transaction because A, technically you don't have a contract at all. And B, even if we're working on those files as diligently as we possibly can, we're not in control of that situation. And in many cases, your sellers will say, it's not a problem. Everybody's gonna come to closing. We'll handle all the paperwork that needs to happen. And then fast forward to the day of closing. Now, all of a sudden we have a problem. So if you think about what potentially happens to the other side's damages in this contract phase. So at the point of discovery, when that commitment first comes out, the damages to a buyer who now is not going to close are pretty minimal. They probably haven't even spent money on appraisal or survey or inspections or anything like that because you're three to five days into the contract. Fast forward to this situation happening at closing now, you're 21 days into the contract, you're gonna have a buyer who's spent money on all those things. You're gonna have a buyer whose rate lock is probably expiring today. And you're gonna have a buyer who's homeless over the weekend because now they don't have anywhere to go because the deal's blown up. Obviously the damages have increased significantly then to that purchaser. 
And of course, when, when buyers and sellers end up getting crosswise, who do they blame? They blame you guys and they blame us. <laughs> so as an agent, when you have a situation where first you recognize that you no longer have a valid contract, you do need to have some conversation with the other side. Now, I don't think you run screaming to the other side. We don't have a contract because definitely in today's market, they're going to love the next house they saw. <laughs> but I do think it's incumbent upon you guys to say to the other side, hey, I recognize we've got three other people in title. I've sent out an amendment for them to sign joining the contract. That protects you guys as agent. That's because you've identified a situation, you've notified the parties, and then if you know everything continues and then it blows up, you're protected. So the answer to the question I just saw pop up in chat is, should you be checking the names on the title commitment when it comes back? And the answer is absolutely. That's the first chance that you guys are gonna have to know if there is a problem in the chain of title based on what you thought when you brought us the contract versus where we really are once we get down the, the line of closing. So if you're not used to looking at your commitments when they come in, you wanna look at schedule A where it says title vested and that should be your seller's name. If not, you need to call us, ask us what we're going to do with it. We'll tell you how much the customer is going to have to be involved, and that'll make for a smoother closing transition. Next slide, please. Next thing I like to talk about is the property paragraph. So switching legal concepts on you now, and we're going to talk about ambiguity. So um, when what the law says is when we write up a contract, if there is a term that's later deemed to be ambiguous, and ambiguity means there's one or more phrases that has one or more different meanings or has more than one meaning. Um, as an example, I like to use the word escrow here. So we are an escrow company. I have escrow officers that work for us. We escrow your contract. We charge an escrow fee and the whole process is called escrow. Um, and your buyers are, are probably setting up an escrow account for their taxes and insurance. So if I use that one little word escrow, got five or six different meanings. The law says if I write that term into a contract and then later we have a dispute and I say it means one thing and you say it means another, the law says the ambiguity is construed against the drafter of the document. And that's going to be me as the buyer. You know, sellers aren't usually drafting documents. It's almost always the buyer. But if you think about when a buyer is writing up a contract and they're writing terms and they're writing phrases by way of you guys in the contract, it's their meaning that's going to be the most important to them, right? You know, the buyer is not going to say, hey, I hope the seller means this. Let's go with the seller's meaning. They want what they think it means. And that becomes really important when we deal with legal descriptions, specifically when we're getting outside of the lot block environment. Because if you guys write up a contract and the legal is ambiguous, maybe it's missing a tract, maybe it incorrectly describes the tract of land, that's what we're going to open title on. That's what we're going to close, assuming the seller owns that. And then, you know, I'll give you a real life example. We had a contract come in years and years ago, and the contract was written, was written for lot six. So we opened lot six, we closed lot six, and right after closing, we find out that there was a portion of lot seven that was intended to convey and the septic to the house on lot six is on lot seven. So now you have a functionally obsolete home. The buyers are upset. You know, the buyers are saying, I don't understand. Both tracks were listed in MLS. We talked about both tracks all the time. And when a court looks at that situation, they're gonna look at the contract and say, I understand there's some ambiguity about what was intended to convey. However, you guys wrote the contract up only for lot six. And since the buyer writes the contract only for lot six, the ambiguity is construed against the drafter of that document. So the seller wins. What do you think happens to the price of that lot <laughs> that's now needed for the home? It goes up substantially. So as an agent, when you guys are writing contracts on behalf of your buyers, most of you guys, I think, pull um, you know whatever pulls into the system from the CAD, and that works perfectly when you've got a plain lot and block situation. If you're doing multiple tracks, if you're getting into acreage, you want to make sure that you are sufficiently describing that tract of land in this uh, contract, because if there becomes an, amb an ambiguity fight, the buyer's going to lose. So be cautious about that, and we'll talk about that as we go further into some other paragraphs too. Something that is new here in this paragraph of the contract 
is now, Trek has clarified that under accessories, any security systems that aren't a fixture and also the controls for those security systems are also now intended to convey. That's gonna be your Nest, your Google Home. We'll talk about that in a second. Another spot for y'all to be careful with, with ambiguity is section D. So section A through C says, this is everything that's gonna convey with the property. Section D says, accept these items. So it's not necessarily a huge risk item here, but item D is where I see a lot of realtors having to buy flat screen TVs and other items that everybody thought was gonna convey with the property on the buyer side. Something that I commonly see there under item D is flat screen TV. So maybe the, it's a big home and there's a very specialty wall and there's a nice big television on it. And through negotiations, you know, the conversation's been, it is physically affixed to that wall. And so it would be something that is intended to convey. You do the walkthrough, that piece is gone now and the buyers are upset. Um, think about ambiguity when you're writing things in this paragraph that are going to be retained by the seller. Because when buyers are looking at homes, they don't know what a fixture is. You know, they rely on you guys to fill in that information. If there is something very specific that they're in love with that they think is going to stay, you need to describe it here with specificity. Flat screen TV, TV doesn't do it. You know, the brand of the television, the room that it's in, something where if 10 people are looking at that description, all 10 are going to have the same information versus 10 people thinking something different. Um, next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about what is a security system that's not a fixture, because fixtures are obviously things that are nailed down to the house, screwed into the wall. Now the contract requires that security systems that aren't nailed down are intended to convey. These are your doorbells, um, you know, security cameras outside, things like that. Reason this is in the contract now is because you don't have to have it in the non-realty addendum now. So it's important to know that your seller shouldn't be taking that doorbell with them and, and moving on. Next slide, please. All right, shifting topics again and giving you a different legal theory. So um, sales price seems pretty straightforward. You write in your sales price, you write in your loan amount if you're gonna have one. Um, if you intend to have a third party financing addendum attached to your contract, it's critically important that you check the box here or in paragraph 22. Um, your contract is a standalone document. So it's only 11 pages and the addendums aren't legally attached to the document unless you check one of the boxes in the contract that pulls it in. It's called incorporation by reference. So even if you have the contract fully executed, you had a third party financing addendum fully executed, but you didn't check that box in either paragraph. When that comes into the title company, we might receipt it, we might send the whole thing out, and now let's fast forward to where your buyer wants to terminate. And the only option they have to terminate under is now third-party financing. Every other contingency has, has gone away because of timing. If that little box is checked, even if everybody has signed all of the addendums, if the box is left unchecked, excuse me, legally speaking, your contract is in your right hand, all the addendums are in your left hand, and your left hand just open the car window and let go because those don't exist anymore. So you have to think about the contract as being one document and the only way to pull everything in is to check the boxes to bring it in. Next slide, please. Latra, we had a couple quick questions. Um, is, it is it legally accurate to enter hard money or bridge loans as cash or show as finance, but don't check a box? Yeah, so that, that always brings up a good debate that we have. Um, so the reason that you show how much money is going to be in the loan amount or in the sales price is to indicate what your intent is for financing. Intent in that situation doesn't necessarily matter unless you're in a multiple offer situation like we are right now, because that's not a binding term if you don't check the uh, third party financing addendum. So legally what happens is if you don't check any of those boxes and you know you're gonna go out and get hard money, um, if your deal falls through, you just have a hard contract. And so you lose your earnest money if you don't close. There's not really an addendum that deals with third-party financing in the, in the section of hard money. So it's fine for you to put that in there. You just have to know that if it falls through and you don't use the addendum, that you're going to have a hard contract. Okay. All right. 
One more. Um, one more. Why don't fridges convey? Since they have a water line that is attached to the wall, is that not considered um, something that exists and stays with the property? Yeah, you know, the, the water line is a fixture because it's actually attached, but the way that the fridge connects to that water line is still just, you know, an unscrewing type of situation. So it's not, when you think about fixtures, you need to think about something where if you remove it, there's potential damage to the property, even if that damage is minor, you know, it's paint or it's um, holes in the sheetrock kind of stuff. The fridge is just an, an unconnection, unconnecting it there. Thank you. All right, and then I've got one from Kim that says, if a buyer wants to potentially change the amount down from what is written in the contract, do they need to have an amendment? Lenders have told me no. I disclose it to the sellers and have written it in special provisions that the buyer may change financing terms. Good question. Um, really, we don't, re we don't require an amendment. Lenders don't require an amendment. The key is that the parties show up at closing on time with the amount of money that they intended to for the seller. So, and this is happening kind of regularly now. We'll have people say there's a third party financing addendum. They'll show a loan amount in paragraph three. They change their mind during the transaction and they end up paying cash. That doesn't have a negative effect on the legality of that contract. Okay. All right, um, let's talk about another new paragraph for your contract, which is leases. So some of the content's not new. Your contracts have always said seller's not aware of any leases and he's not allowed to sign any prior to closing. Um, but that didn't fit your situation if you were selling a piece of property that in fact had tenants in it. So now the contract has been changed to say, except as disclosed below, seller doesn't know of any leases and they won't execute any prior to closing. They have now given you three options for three different types of leases, residential, fixture, and then also natural resources. So if you're selling a piece of property that has tenants in it, you have to now look at it. And when you're writing an offer on the buyer side, you guys need to do the research to find out if the tenants, if there is a lease on the property or not. We're not talking about seller and buyer lease facts here. We're only talking about an actual lease on the property. So if you'll take me to that next slide, please. All right, so if you check box A to say there is a residential lease on the property, then now you have a new addendum that you need to use for the addendum regarding residential leases. So this one has two options. Either the leases are gonna be terminated at the time of closing. And you know if you'll look at the language there, not only does the tenant lease have to be terminated at the time of closing, but the seller is also obligated to deliver possession. And that means the tenants need to be out of the property. They can't still be in it. So when that addendum is used, you need to make sure on your seller side that your seller knows the tenant's got to be able to vacate prior to closing. It can't be one of those, oh, he's a nice guy, he can stay the weekend, he's got to be out of that property. Second option there would be if your leases are going to convey, and this is intended to assign the leases over to the seller, which we've not had before in the residential context. It's also intended to require a copy of the leases be given to the buyer, which is important. Um, it also says we're going to pass through security deposits. And an issue I can see coming up there is some lenders are not going to want us to pass those through. But the contract requires we do so. And then you have a landlord estoppel. Estoppel basically means the landlord is saying that all of the items in that paragraph are correct um, and factual. So um, I see a question pop up that says, does this addendum legally cancel a TREC or a TAR lease? No. So these are independent contracts. You have a contract with your tenant under the lease and you have a contract with your purchaser under the TREC form. So where it says all residential leases must be terminated by closing, that's going to be a nuanced thing that the seller needs to make sure that he's looking at the lease to find out, does it really terminate beforehand? Because if it doesn't terminate beforehand, if you can't get the tenants out of the property before closing, the seller is now going to be breaching the contract. So when you're selling on the listing side, um, a residential piece of property that has tenants in it, I think it's advisable for you to go ahead and make sure that your owner knows where the leases are, have them give you guys a copy so you can check it, make sure that they really are going to be out of the property at a certain date. Um, right now you rely on your sellers. You know, if you've got a tenant in a property, property, you say lease ends March 15th, they're probably not giving you that documentation. They're just telling you. And so before you make that representation, you know, you want to look at it. Next slide, please. 
The next type of lease that we um, have in there is the lease for fixtures. So let's first talk about what a fixture is. Um, a fixture is going to be, think of it in your brain as an aftermarket add-on to the house. <laughs> so it's something where we've added a solar panel, we've added propane tanks, water softener, security system. Um, I'm actually really excited that we added this to the contract because we've had a ton of closings fall apart on the day of closing because there's a fixture on the property that nobody knew about up until now. Reason that comes up is, let's say that your client's gone out and had a solar panel company install a roof full of solar panels. Typically they get a loan to do that. Most of them aren't paying cash, but they get a loan to do that. And they have a separate set of debt that's tied to just those solar panels. And because those solar panels are what's defined by the law as a removable item, Technically, if that lien holder was not paid in full, they have the right to go out to the property, take their materials back and try to recoup whatever money they could if they're not getting paid. This is also one of those liens that survives foreclosure. So even if you're selling a foreclosure property, if there is a lien holder out there um, that is owed money, they have the right to go back and take it off the, 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 uh, the roof as well. Same thing with water softeners and security systems. Because people install these in their homes and they live with it for a long time and they don't even think about it, it's not one of those items that they're telling us prior to closing. When you get to closing, there's an affidavit that your seller signs and we ask this question. We say, do you have solar panels, propane tanks, water softeners installed in the property and is there any debt associated with it? Folks, that's not the right time to be asking the question because we're at closing and we're signing documents. And when your seller says, oh, actually I do owe on my water softener. We have to stop your closing, get a payoff statement, which may be quick, may take a long time. Um, and then we've got to rework the CDs, get lender approval, you know, and ultimately close. So nine times out of 10, when I get that phone call that says our client owes money on a water softener, we're not making the closing that day. So we've shifted to where we ask the question up front. We have a questionnaire that we send out to your sellers and we ask them to fill it out about one or two days after the contract's gone out, but not all title, title companies are gonna ask that question. So to prevent having this type of issue, now you've got an addendum that's required. So when you're working through your listing presentations, you want to make sure that you're asking your client if they've got solar panels, propane tanks, water softeners, security systems, I'd put it in the listing if you do, if you find out they have it, because that way you know the addendum is required. Um, also, the addendum talks about, is the buyer going to assume the, the items or not? It also says that a copy of the fixture leases has to be given to the purchaser. Once they're given to the purchaser under B2 there, there's another contingency that the buyer could terminate within seven days after receiving that. So there's one more contingency that's been added to your contract. And then the last item requires that the liens be paid in full at closing or assumable by the buyer. So when we're working up your files and we've got solar panels or water softeners in there, lately we've started getting more notices where people say there is a security system and it is still, money is still owed on it and it's going to be assumable by the buyer. That part is all good for us. Um, the one thing that we have to make sure of is if that fixture lien holder has filed what's called a UCC in the real property records, that's how they evidence their lien. They have to be willing to subordinate to the new mortgage company that's coming in with your buyer. If they're not willing to subordinate, and we've run into this quite a bit lately, then that lien has to be paid in full. So it's one of those things where buyer and seller talk prior to going under contract and the buyer says, you know, how much do you owe? The seller tells them, buyer says, fine, I'll assume it. And that's great. And that's what the parties have agreed upon, but the lien holder is not willing to give that subordination. So that's something that now we'll know up front and we can start asking all the right questions before we get there. I've seen a couple pop-ups. Let me look at the notes. You got them or you want me to read you? I think I got them here. All right. All right. Um, what is the proper way to draw up a lease back when we'll have an option to extend after the term listed in the agreement? Um, we'll come back to that one. Chris, I'll write down your name and we'll get some. All right, um, explain if the third party is checked on paragraph 22, but not paragraph one, then you could still terminate with financing. Yes. So all of your addendums to be incorporated by reference 
everyone except the third party financing, you check in paragraph 22. Third party financing is the one where you have an option to do um, paragraph three or paragraph 22. And then we have talking about fixtures. What if they're on a payment plan and not on lease? If there's debt associated with it, we have to wrap that up at closing now. So if what we need to do is go to that particular creditor and find out if it's just a straight assumption, um, then they give us paperwork at closing to be signed where the buyer assumes it, and that's fine. Um, if they won't do it, then it has to be paid. All right, well, if you'll keep one more. While Nicole's moving um, that, I do want to just briefly mention about the third lease that's in that lease paragraph deals with natural resource leases. Um, what that paragraph says is that if your seller has negotiated any mineral leases during their ownership period, they have to make the disclosure. There was some concern that that meant that the sellers were going to have to go all the way back in the chain and find all the mineral leases, and that's not what that says, just ones where they were a party to it. All right, so let's talk about the big change in the contract. So the big change for you guys deals with earnest money, option money, and where options gonna be found in the contract now. So personally, I'm super excited about this change. I think it saves you guys a lot of time. It also helps our folks out quite a bit. Um, starting with the new contracts, which are available for use now, mandatory as of April 1st, when you write a new contract, your client on the buyer side is now able to deliver earnest money and option money to the title company, and the title company is responsible for receiving that option money. So no longer do you have to educate your client about writing two different checks um, to two different people in two different amounts. <laughs> um, your clients can now use the Zocom app to deposit all of the money with us electronically, which is great. Um, we're not in the position anymore of having to handle that $100 or lately $5,000 option check and get it over and delivered to the seller. And that's a good fail safe for you guys, because the way that the contracts operated before, and I would start using the contract today if, if I were a real estate agent, the old contract placed a ton of liability on you guys as the agent to deliver that option money properly. And in fact, if the option money was delivered to title or not delivered to the seller on time, your client had a hard contract. And if they had a hard contract and if they lost their, their earnest money because the option wasn't properly created by the real estate agent, um, Trek has been requiring that real estate agents pay refunds back. So for you guys, this is a, an actually a, a good way to take you out of that liability spot because all the money is going to come to us. I can see one question pop up there. Um, Okay, well, I see yes, which I'm super excited about. Thank you. Um, if you handle it to the title company, um, okay, so the question is, if you're using the old contract, will the title company still handle the option money? If you're using the old contract for the rest of this month, when the option money comes to us, we'll still handle it and deliver it to the seller. Starting April 1st, it's mandatory that you use the new contract. So then you would have your client write both checks to us, which is what we're, we're excited about. Um, I lost my slide there. There, all right. Um, so let's talk about what happens practically with the money. So your client is going to write, I would say write one check. There is no reason for them to write two checks anymore. One check, make it payable to Texas National Title and make it payable for the dollar amount of the earnest money and also the dollar amount of the option money. So make sure that they're just doing one check or one zoc. You deliver the contract to us, money's delivered to us will now be responsible for receiving the earnest money and the option money, which is great for us. Um, when money comes in, now it's on the same timeline also, because in the old contracts, your earnest money was due within three days, but there was an excuse for performance if, the, if we're closed, if it was a Saturday, Sunday, or federal holiday. So option or earnest money had the, the ability to pay the next day. Option money didn't change though. So option money was due to the seller, and it was also due to the seller within three regular calendar days, regardless of if you fell on a weekend or if you fell on a holiday. And that's a ton of scrambling around for you guys. So now that the checks are together in one check, they're together on the same timeline and they're together on who they're actually coming to. And that's us. And we're super excited about that too. Yes, you can use a personal check. 
Um, next thing in the in the contract gives you an option if you're going to have additional earnest money, which we're not seeing a ton of lately. Paragraph 5A2 talks about the excuse for performance if the money is due on a federal holiday or the weekend. And then paragraph three is important for you guys. So let's say that your buyer messes up and they write the check for the wrong amount. Well, obviously preserving the option is equally important, if not more important than getting that earnest money delivered to most of your purchasers. So your contract now says, if your client writes the check for the wrong amount, when we take the money in, it's applied to the option fee first to preserve that option for you and then the earnest money second. So we would still be short on the earnest money. Your client still needs to replace it but you've pres preserved that option in the very beginning. Um, next, let's talk about what's gonna happen with the money. So I will love you guys forever if you will just let us hold the money until the contract funds, <laughs> because that's the easiest thing for my folks. And I don't really want a whole bunch of checks being cut once we get the money in and sent out to a bunch of random sellers because it creates some administrative nightmare. Um, your sellers have the right under the contract. So they could call us up and say, Hey, Latra, I know you have the earnest money and the option money. I would like the option money written to me and delivered to me. And that's fine. And we can do that. However, we have to wait for that earnest money check to clear. So we have 15 business days before we know if a check is going to clear or not. So if someone writes us a standard check, we've got to wait to make sure that it clears. So your seller wouldn't get that option money delivered until after 15 business days. So already we're really close to the timeline there. Obviously, if your client sends a wire, um, then of course, you know, we have immediate funds and we can deliver right away then too. Wires or cashier's checks, yes. Got a couple more questions there. All right, what if buyer does not deposit enough for both the option and the earnest money? Okay, we just talked about that. Can the seller still legally terminate if the full earnest money is not received in the time frame? Yes, yes, so we'll get there in a second. And can we do wires or cashier's checks? Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, starting today, if you guys are using the new contracts, you can educate your customers that they write one check, they make it payable for both amounts, and they deliver it to the title company. Next slide, please. All right. Um, your option now is in paragraph 5B. It used to be in paragraph 23, so we've lumped them all together now. Option still works exactly the same way that it does in the old contracts. Whatever date you guys write in there for how many days of option you have is going to be what your option period's for. Terminations have to be done by 5 p.m. local time where the property is located. And that one I can't stress enough lately. We've had a lot of out-of-state buyers with out-of-state representation, and they are terminating at 5 o'clock California time. That's too late. <laughs> your option is over at that point. So something to keep in mind if you've got people that are in other, other time zones, the five o'clock deadline for termination is Texas or wherever we are. To talk to the uh, question you guys had a minute ago about what happens if the buyer fails to deliver the earnest money, this is where in paragraph C, the seller has the right to terminate then if they've not delivered it so they can go on about selling the property. Um, and the same with the option. Obviously, if no money's delivered, they don't have any option either. And when we... When we lawyers say time is of the essence in a paragraph, that really means that it's a drop dead date. So the time for delivery, even if you have a federal holiday in there, it's gonna be the morning of the next day, not, or it's gonna be that night, sorry. It's not gonna be like, well, it's inconvenient. I could get there by Wednesday, drop dead date, time is of the essence. Next thing, please, Nicole. All right. Let's move away from earnest and option and talk a little bit more about protecting you guys from a legal standpoint. Um, I like to talk about shortages in area. We also call it area and boundary and we call it survey deletion. And that comes from paragraph 6A of the contract. So I want you guys to all think about that time where you're standing in the front of a property and you're looking at the house and your seller said, or your buyer says, is that my fence or is it the neighbors? I'm sure all of you can raise your hands and have that question asked. The reason your clients are asking you that is because it's important to them where the boundary lines are of their property. And they wanna make sure that you know they own up to a certain point. Something that I think you guys should all know about title insurance is that your standard title policy that's issued from closing offers zero protection for defense of the boundary lines. So think, of, think about that one. That means day one, your buyer moves in, they're in love with the house, neighbor knocks on the door and says, 
your fence is on my property. I need you to move your fence three feet into your lot. Your buyers are going to be upset. They're going to call the title company. We're going to tell them they don't have any insurance for that. So that's a terrible situation. And that creates a lot of liability for you guys as buyer's agents because you know they have so much faith and trust placed in you. You've got the fiduciary relationship. And more importantly, you guys are the ones filling out this contract. This little box right here, paragraph 6A8, is such a teeny tiny little piece of the transaction that it's not important to buyers and it's not important to sellers when you're negotiating stuff. Typically, and I'm sure all of y'all can, can agree, you guys are the ones making this selection. And so I want you to understand what you're declining or what you're selecting for your client. If you'll go to the next slide, Nicole. Okay, so here's what your title policy says when we're going to issue one. It says item number two on schedule B that the title insurance policy doesn't cover any discrepancies with regard to the boundary line, doesn't cover a conflict with the neighbor, doesn't cover encroachment, which are things into our lot. It doesn't cover protrusions, which is stuff on our lot poking into the neighbors. Basically, if there's a fight about anything dealing with the boundary line of the property, it is not covered under insurance. When you guys check the box that says it will be amended, what you're doing from a legal standpoint is you're adding most of that coverage back into the title policy so that if your buyer has an issue, they have a way to be able to seek relief. They have a policy they can file a claim under. If it's an acceptable claim, we hire the lawyers to litigate it basically. The coverage is super cheap. It's 5% of the owner's title policy on a residential transaction. And you know, on a $500,000 deal, that's about $150. So think about the liability as an agent. If you're checking the box to say that it is not going to be amended and you go through closing and now your client needs that coverage, they don't have it, they could have benefited from it and they could have just paid 150 bucks to hire it. Now, whatever the issue is, they're gonna have to hire their own attorney. It's gonna cost them $10,000. Whose fault is that going to be? going to be the agent's fault. So I want you guys to think about that. If you're in the habit of marking the box that says it's not going to be amended, I would like for you to shift and check the box that says it is going to be amended because your client can still opt out of it. You know, if your client opts out of it, we should say that they had informed consent and that's all on them. It's not a liability issue for you and it's not a liability issue for me. But if they don't get the option to explore that, then you've made the decision. And that's when it's a dangerous situation. I saw a pop-up that said, even if we have a new survey. And yes, I think it's important even if you have a new survey because surveyors, you know, in theory, if they make a mistake, they've got privity of contract. So they have a, a fiduciary responsibility to have accuracy for the buyer. But what's it gonna cost your client to collect against the brand new surveyor? Or what's it cost your client to file a claim under the title policy? Cost them money if they're gonna try to sue the surveyor Cost them nothing to go through the, the title policy claim process. Nature, can the buyer and the seller split that cost? Sure, absolutely. Your contract doesn't provide for it, so you'd have to write that in special provisions. Okay. But you can write, you know, seller and buyer to split area and boundary 50%. Yeah. And Pat says, who pays buyer or sellers? So in today's market, I'm seeing the buyers pay most of the time. Um, but, you know, I have to say that if I were selling a, prop a property personally and the buyer wasn't going to get it over cost, I'd probably want to pay for it because then I know that there's insurance between me and that purchaser. So if something went wrong, something wasn't right about the boundary lines, they're going to file the claim before they come back and, and sue me. Can I have the next slide, please? So here's a real life example of how this works. <laughs> Let's say that we've been asked to insure the tract on the right-hand side. And by the way, I know my drawings are amazing. Don't be jealous. <laughs> we've been asked to insure the tract on the right-hand side there that's five acres. And we get that survey in from the seller. It shows the boundary line of the property. And it also shows this fence line that's about five feet in from our property. So five feet between the property line and our house. So when I talk to that seller, I say, hey, what's going on with your, uh, with your fence there? And he says, oh, that fence is my neighbor's, but don't worry. He knows that he doesn't own up to that part. He knows that the property line is really five feet in. Well, that's cute, but I'm going to have to talk to the neighbor now and find out because obviously when the neighbor comes back, he says, nope, absolutely not. I own all the way up to that fence line. And so now we have that area in the middle where I've drawn that says it's a conflict. I have our seller who thinks he owns that portion and I have the neighbor who thinks he owns that portion. So I asked the neighbor to bring his 
survey in. And when he brought his survey in that was new as part of his transaction, that survey showed that he owned all the way up to the fence line. It was just wrong. And the same surveyor had done both side-by-side -side tracks about five years apart. So now, of course, the seller on our track did what I never advised, which is go out on Saturday and just rip up the whole fence line because that's going to make everybody upset too. But now those two neighbors are in a position where they're going to have to litigate, arbitrate, mediate something between each other to come to terms about who really is gaining or losing that tract. And if you think about five feet all the way down a five acre tract of land, that's a significant amount of value that somebody is looking to lose. If this is your customer and if this is found out post-closing and they've gotten this insurance, they've got a policy they can go back against. If they don't have that insurance, they're reaching into their pocket every single time they talk to their lawyer. And this is an egregious case, but this is exactly why I think it's important for you guys to not be the decider on it. You tell them they're getting the coverage and then they can decline it is very different from you not giving, saying they're not going to have the coverage. Next slide, please. This is a more common example. So where I've highlighted that yellow fence on the right-hand side of the property, you know, the fence is about five feet in that little corner off and then it tapers up to where it's on the property line. Minor issue, um, but if as the buyer's agent, you've said that they're not gonna have coverage for this ish item, then you're basically, you know, getting into your own checkbook if something goes sideways from it. So I always think you guys should check that box. Next slide, please. All right, I'm going to go kind of quick because I'm running out of time here. Um, first thing that's important for you guys to know on the paragraph about the commitment is that we have an obligation to deliver the title commitment and also all Schedule B documents. For us, we hyperlink all of those Schedule B docs so we can send them to the buyer. This is important for you guys as buyer's agents because this is where you shift your due diligence from you being the expert on what's contained in those documents to the buyer. By providing copies of all the stuff to the buyer, if down the road, the buyer's upset because now they can't add a secondary dwelling on the property or they can't paint their front porch blue or do any of the things they might wanna do with the property, we and you have given them disclosure of what the limitations are on that property. We're running into a lot of issues right now where we will have somebody buy a residential piece of land that has one property on it. They wanna put an ADU or a mother-in-law home or you know something so that they can now sell it into two different units. They've gone so far as to finish their plans and build that second unit. And now they've brought the contract back to us trying to sell it. And when we go back and we look at the restrictions, we see that the restrictions prohibit anything other than single family. They prohibit this new dwelling that's been added. So obviously that buyer is upset <laughs> and that buyer is gonna come back to us and they're gonna come back to you guys and say, well, somebody should have told me I couldn't add a second unit. And we're gonna say, we actually did. We gave you a copy of the commitment and we gave you the document copy that prohibits that. And as an agent, that's a really powerful thing because it takes that liability off of you guys. Um, I just saw a question. Okay, oh yeah. All right, um, something about surveys. So obviously we're getting some really tight timelines written in for surveys now. We have a fair amount of debate about is the survey required with the T47 to satisfy this provision in the contract? And it is. We typically get surveys in, no problem. And then it's inconvenient for the sellers to come in and sign a T47. And so they say, oh, I'll sign it at closing. Oh, I'll email it in a couple of days. You guys need to know when you're representing sellers that if your seller doesn't deliver the survey and the T47 within the timeline that's written in there, they can have a new survey purchased at their expense um, when the buyer wants it. So what happens is people read that last paragraph that says if the survey is not acceptable, who pays for it? And that's a wholly separate issue. That third sentence there is what happens if the title doesn't take the survey? What happens if the lender doesn't take it? You got to get through that first hurdle, which is did was it provided with the T47? Next slide, please. All right, uh, your paragraph eight has changed a little bit. Just this is now where you put your disclosure if you're representing somebody where you need to disclose your licensee status also with the relationship with the principal. And then broker's fees, of course, are contained in separate written agreements. A, a note for you guys about the broker's fees and commissions. Our group is always gonna assume that the commission is 3% on both sides. 
If you're changing the structure, if you've agreed to some other terms, if you'll please let us know up front. Um, we hate to send out a, a draft CD and it's got the wrong amount of commissions on it because then your clients get upset. So if you're charging something different, let us know up front, please. Um, when we talk about paragraph nine, I always like to point this out. We get a lot of sellers, especially investor sellers that say probably the day before closing, oh, I'm only going to sign a special warranty deed. And I think it's important for them to know that contractually they've agreed to sign a general warranty deed. So it's great for them to tell us last minute that they want to sign something different, but they've already obligated themselves to sign a general. So for those of you that do commercial or do farm and ranch, you know, in that contract, there's an option for a general warranty deed or a special warranty deed. In residential, that's just not an option. So your parties would have to go outside of the contract before getting to the contract phase to negotiate that. Next slide, please. All right. Um, next slide is going to be paragraph 10, which is the possession paragraph. So paragraph 10 has had an addition to it for the smart devices. So in addition to transferring the possession of the property, your clients also have to transfer the smart device part. And I kind of call it, this is, I laugh at this one because I call it the creeper paragraph. Look at paragraph B2. The contract now has to require that if your seller had a smart device, like, uh, you know, a home, a Google Home or a um, a ring doorbell, they have to take that app off their phones. And they should, because otherwise it's creepy. So when you have your listing checklists of all the things that your sellers have to do, I think you guys should add to it, you know, write down all the access codes if it's something in the property that's gonna convey and delete the app from your phone so that they no longer have access to that once they get through closing. Next slide, please. Special provisions. So you guys all know that writing things in special provisions is a tricky spot for a real estate agent to be in. Um, number one, track is very clear that you're not to write escalation clauses in there. So you shouldn't be writing something like buyer will pay $5,000 higher than best price. Um, that's a smart thing for you to all never put in there. And then the, the way that I teach when I'm talking about special provisions is if you're going to write something in here, I want you to think about the fact that you're writing it with your own checkbook. Because if something goes wrong from what you put in here as an agent, the liability is gonna come back to you guys. So little things like home to be professionally clean, you're not gonna make it through a long successful real estate career without paying to have a house re-cleaned. Um, if you're getting further into things that are more expensive, like seller to transfer foundation warranty, you know, if something goes wrong with the foundation warranty, that can be a very big ticket item. The bigger the dollar amount's gonna be, the more I think you need to go back and get with your broker and say, this is what my client wants me to put in here. Should I be doing anything with this? And your team leaders are great. They're gonna tell you, absolutely not. We've had this situation before. Here's what you can put. You don't wanna go rogue and just write stuff in here on your own. That said, we get a lot of out-of-state purchasers right now and they're used to writing things in there. And if you really have a client that's gonna dig their heels in about, this has to be in there, then have them send you the language. And then you're including exactly what they put in there. You're not making it up. You're not editing. You're just following your client's instructions. I can't stress enough how important it is to go to your team lead if you have questions about what's going to go in special provisions, because this, this is also an ambiguity issue. You know, I, saw, I always laugh because I saw a contract one time that said seller to repaint front of house. And I, you know, I giggled like what's on sale at Home Depot this weekend? Lime green. Here we go. <laughs> you know, you have to be very specific. Um, paragraph 12 I have in there for you, just so that everybody understands that when you write a dollar amount for seller expenses in there, it is an up to amount. We get a lot of last minute conversation going on when there's not enough costs that either the lender allows or that are just part of the transaction to fill that dollar amount. So some people think if you write $10,000 in there, that just means the buyer gets a credit. That's not how it operates. You have to actually have $10,000 worth of fees to pay for that item. Next slide, please. All right, um, tax proration. So this is a spot where you guys as agents can accidentally end up um, with your clients upset, and potentially some liability, particularly when we're dealing with the county and exemptions that are currently on the property, but do not apply to the subsequent purchaser. So when we have a closing come in, we scrub that tax certificate and we look at it and we see, is there an over 65? 
Is there a disability exemption? Is there a vet exemption? Because those are all types of exemptions where your seller has been paying a reduced amount of taxes based on their status. Um, the county is very fickle about taking those exemptions off when we have a sale transaction. A couple of years ago, they started figuring out that there's money being left on the table. And so every time a warranty deed is recorded, I think they look at that specific account and say, wait, is there some money we should have been collecting? So when we get those tax certificates, we're going to send a notice out to both sides of the transaction that says, hey, we've got these exemptions. We need your help and guidance on figuring out how we're going to prorate the taxes between the parties. Because if they're prorated wrong, or if we miss that proration, then the buyer's going to end up getting a bill. And if the county takes all of those exemptions off, that bill is significantly higher and they can be very upset. So this is definitely a, a one by one kind of review that we do. And so when we're contacting you guys about it, make sure you're getting back with us because we need to talk to you about your file to figure out the best course of action, basically. Paragraph 15 is the default paragraph. That's what covers what happens if the buyer or the seller breaches the contract. I do always like to point out paragraph 16 and paragraph 17 um, when I'm talk, teaching you guys this class because Sometimes you'll have a contract that is just kind of falling apart and your clients are mad and they're not necessarily being rational <laughs> and you're kind of stuck for what you can talk to them about. You know, you turn into kind of their counselor and you're trying to get them resolved and, and talked off the ledge a little bit. And these paragraphs can help you. So if you've got a client who is saying what I always chuckle at is, well, I'll just sue everybody involved in this transaction. <laughs> I don't think you go into, you know, a whole bunch of legal advice, but I do think you can say to them, I just want you to know that the contract that you executed does agree to go to mediation before a lawsuit is, is filed. What that means is if you go and you file a lawsuit, it's going to be kicked back out to mediation and then you'd be out fees and costs and all that other stuff. Mediation would have to happen first. The other thing that paragraph 17 does, and this is unique um, in Texas, usually what Texas law says is if there's a lawsuit, both parties are responsible for their costs of defense. So the defendant pays their costs, the plaintiff pays their costs. Your contracts come in and they, they go over that though. And they say, except the contract says, if there's a lawsuit, the prevailing party um, doesn't really pay any attorney's fees and the losing party pays everybody's attorney's fees. So for your clients that are um, just mad and you're just trying to talk through logic with them, you could say, you know, I just want you to know that if you did file a lawsuit and you weren't successful, on top of this injury you already have, you would also be paying the other side's attorney's fees. So I want you to think about that. And you'll know better than I do which clients you can say that to and which ones you just don't even have that conversation with. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right, paragraph 18. So a couple of things in paragraph 18. First, it says that we're not a party to the contract as the title company side. And that's important to us because we're constantly put in the position of clients asking us to make decisions of who's wrong or right, who breached this contract, are they in default? And we're just not really able to speak to any of that because we're actually required to be a neutral objective third party. Paragraph A did have a sentence added that says we can require if we're gonna disperse any funds that we make sure we have good funds first. So that speaks back to release of the option money. We've got to make sure that that money is cleared our bank before we can release it. That's why it's not released just the day that we get it. Because surprise, surprise, people do write us hot checks more than you would imagine. The other thing that I want you guys to know about this paragraph, and this is super helpful for you to be the hero sometimes. Let's say you have a transaction that is terminated and we've sent the notice of termination and the release of earnest money out to all parties. And we're just not hearing anything. It's just crickets your clients, the buyer, and your clients getting upset because they feel like they should get the earnest money back and we've not been able to release it. Something you can do as a buyer's agent is you can have your client send us a demand and the demand can be super simple. It can say, dear Latra, on this property, I demand my earnest money. I take that demand and I send it over to the other side of the transaction. And if they've not responded to me within 15 business days, I'm permitted by contract to release the money that's been requested. So it's not an often used thing, but it's very important for you guys to know if your client's getting frustrated and you know, we didn't have what we needed to be able to release the earnest money and there's no response, this is a way you can jump in and help. Here's the kicker though. And now you're gonna get a little bit of Latris soapbox. Um, where do I have to send my notices? 
I have to send my notices to the address in paragraph 21 in order to comply with this contract. So um, Nicole, if you'll go to the next slide. So paragraph 21 is what controls all of the notice that we have to send. So if you're asking me to honor a paragraph 18C demand, I have to be able to send it somewhere. <laughs> Probably half the contracts we get in are blank here. Um, you know, I really can't stress how important it is that you guys give at least us buyer and seller contact information. One of the things that we do um, is we send, we call every buyer and every seller and talk to them about wire fraud. We talk to them about all of the possible things that they might see and what they need to be diligent about watching out for. We then send them a follow-up email. We have similar conversations with your sellers and those phone calls over the these past few years for us have been irreplaceable for the amount of money that we've saved buyers from just losing to fraudsters. I've got an example this morning where somebody sent one wire, went to fraudulent wiring instructions. They were going to send a second wire to the bank and the bank called and questioned it. That's a big liability piece for you guys. If you're not already in the, in the habit of having wire fraud conversations with your buyers and your sellers, you need to start doing it because the liability for somebody losing their money because they sent it to a fraudster is huge. It's huge for you guys and it's huge for us. So every time you turn a contract in, if you'll fill in this information for me, or at least give this information to our escrow teams, we're going to call and say to them, you know, at no point in the transaction, are we going to email you wiring instructions? And if you get them, it's fraud. Years ago, we used to say, if you get them, it might be fraud. We're like, nope. If you get them, it's fraud because we're not sending them. We have to make these people, our buyers and our sellers, aware of what more, of what wire fraud looks like. And the only way we do that is through these conversations, which means I have to have their contact information in there. So that's my little soapbox. Let's move on, Nicole. All right, um, paragraph 19, representations. This is good for you guys, especially on the listing side. So on the listing side, you guys get a lot of information that comes from your sellers that you wish they hadn't told you about potential defects in the home. <laughs> um, typically they'll say something like, oh, hey, you know, my pool equipment, it's about to go out. Don't worry, I put a Band-Aid on it. I just have to get through closing. <laughs> How you can speak to that issue with your sellers that are putting you in that awkward position is to use paragraph 19. What paragraph 19 of the contract says is that all representations that are made regarding the property continue after closing. So it's not as simple as let's just get to closing and then whatever the defect issue is, is the buyer's problem. It follows the seller and it can actually follow the seller for up to four years from the date that the issue was discovered. So if you're having that conversation with someone and they don't want to make the disclosure, use this first to try to tell them you need to make the disclosure, you know, it's going to follow you. Paragraph 20, we talk about federal tax requirements. So if you have a seller that is a foreign person, please let us know that up front. There, uh, there are some forms that have to be signed. Typically, there's some money that has to be held and sent to the IRS. There are some exceptions to that process, but we have to work through them on a one-by-one, -one, um, on a case-by-case -case basis. And the time to do that is not at closing when we find out that your seller is a foreign person. Up front is the time to tell us that, so we can kind of work through some of that stuff. Next slide, please. All right, we talked about paragraph 22. This is where you check the box to incorporate by reference any of the addendums that you're gonna be using. Um, make sure that you're checking them, that they're also getting signed, and that they're also getting attached. Next slide, please. Effective date. So here's Latris Mini Soapbox number two. Um, I can't tell you how many contracts we get where the effective date is blank. And I know it happens for a lot of different reasons. You know, When you're putting the offer together, you don't wanna date it because it's not gonna be accepted that day. Um, some people will say, oh, well, that's the last person who's signed it responsibility to fill it in. And so when the buyer's agent brings it in, it'll still be blank. But really, it's every real estate agent involved in that transaction's responsibility to get that date filled in. It's really hard to terminate under option or any of the date related contingencies if you don't have a date filled in there. So, <laughs> um, and then. Next section is just where you guys put your fee sharing information now. It's uh, at the bottom of the contract. Next slide, please. New, new thing in the contract under the option fee receipt, you see that I've highlighted where the escrow agent is now responsible for um, receiving that option money. 
super helpful for you guys as listing agents. You don't have to run around and have it sent to you via DocuSign, print it, scan it. We're just gonna take care of it for you. All right, next slide. Last thing I like to talk about is how the financing contingency actually works. Um, there's a lot of confusion about what third-party financing addendum does or does not do. So um, when I'm explaining this to buyers or to sellers, I say that the third-party financing addendum is basically just another contingency by which the buyer could cancel under the contract. There's a ton of confusion around it because when a buyer is out of any other options to cancel and they're canceling under third-party financing, it's typically later in the transaction. And so then the stress is higher. You know, um, Sellers often will say, well, um, I demand a, um, a, a rejection letter from the lender, which is not an option that's provided for under the terms of the contract. Sellers will say, well, they haven't applied with my guy and my guy can definitely get them a loan not a requirement under the third-party financing addendum. So all the third-party financing addendum says is if the property is subject to approval, the buyer has X number of days to get approved. And if they can't get approval, they just have to terminate. There's no proof requirement with it. There's no multiple application requirements. It's just a pure notice function. And that's important for your sellers to understand. The secondary cancellation provision that comes up under third-party financing deals with the property approval. So we, we bifurcate the approval process and we say one approval process deals solely with the buyer and their ability to get any loan irrespective of what they're buying. And that is paragraph uh, 2A. Then the secondary approval process is property approval. Property approval means regardless of who's buying this property, the lender rejects the property itself. Most common reason they're going to reject it is going to be value, but there might be other reasons that they reject it. Maybe it doesn't fit the particular product that the borrower has applied for. Maybe it has something in the clue report that's really bad and they just don't want to lend on this particular property. But recognize when you're thinking about financing that those are two independent cancellation functions that don't operate uh, with each other. All right, so I see some questions. I'm sorry, I went over time a little bit there. Um, okay, so going back to our lawsuits for specific performance against a buyer actually successful in practice. That is a wonderful question. I'm really glad you asked it, Chris. Um, you know, as long as I've been doing this, which is not really long in the grand scheme of things, but let's give it a solid 15 years. Um, we've not seen a, spe a specific performance lawsuit that was successful against a buyer in a residential context context. Because, you know, the it's kind of the um, blood from a turnip argument. If the buyer really can't purchase the property, then it makes no sense to go through a legal process to require they do so. So it's not very successful on the buyer side. Contrast that with the seller side, much more likely to get um, successful litigation against a seller for specific performance than a buyer. Next question was options can be released without a release sign. So true. So if I look at your contract and I see that um, the option money was receded, which we'll be doing now, so that's great. <laughs> and I see the number of days that were written in your contract um, and we're within those days. And I see that the money was paid um, and I find a date for execution date in your contract then I'll tell the escrow team that it's okay to release during the option period. But that's the only contingency under which I'll let you guys cancel and not have to have the release of earnest money signed because that's clear, it's unequivocal. I can just figure it out looking at the contract only. All right. And then Linda asked, should the demand be sent through a release of earnest money rather than just an email to you? Okay, good. So for paragraph 18C, if you're going to make a demand, this is a really good point. Um, what is not a demand is just sending us the release of earnest money. And what is not a demand is your client writing me this really nice letter that says, would you please consider releasing the earnest money? <laughs> they need to just use the word demand. You know, dear Latra, dear escrow team, this email shall serve as a demand of the earnest money. That's enough to trigger it, but it's got to be something other than just sending that, that notice of release to us. Um, Kim asked, do you prefer a physical address in that notice section or is email only okay? Email is fine. 
Um, you know, email for us is actually better because we're going to use it to send all of the notifications to your client that way. A physical address by itself um, is a little painful because that means we have to actually mail every single thing we're sending to your buyer also, which I hate to have our escrow teams do. So I'd much rather you have an email in there. Um, all right, will we get a copy of the contract with the changes at the end of the course? So yes, um, that copy is also available on track and I'm sure it's in your zip forms by now. I would say start using it right away. Next question is, how would a client who is a permanent resident alien with a green card be classified? So somebody with that is a resident alien with a green card is exempt from the Foreign Investors Real Property Act. Um, so we don't have to withhold taxation on those. And on terminating for third party addendum, could it be written into the contract that the buyer must provide a letter from the lender stating they can't get a loan? Could it be yes? Um, you know, you're getting into a little bit of legal practice there when you're going to write something in special provisions to make that requirement. Um, I, I would want you to check with your team lead before you put too much into that and having that be uh, in your, your standard forms. All right. Uh, what's next? Do you have to have proof to cancel under property approval? I had a property last week get held up from closing because of storm damage and all the inspections that needed to be done after. So property approval is just like the financing addendum for the borrower. It's a notice requirement. Um, the only time you would have to have proof of the property rejection part is going to be if you are using the right to terminate due to lender's appraisal and you've checked the third box that requires a copy of the appraisal be delivered. All right, um, if the appraisal hasn't come in, can the buyer terminate under the third party 2B because the seller does not want to extend closing to save earnest money? Uh, you know, that's again, it's one of those notice provisions. So, and this is where I would never advise agents to, to participate in this, but we do get questions from people that say, I just wanna use any contingency that I have left in the contract, which one should I cancel under? People kind of abuse it sometimes because there's not a proof that's required part. And so as agents, I don't want you to participate in there, but from a legal perspective, we do see people use that unfortunately. And okay, so in practice, you have to have good funds before releasing option fees to sellers. Should we have buyers wire or send cashier's checks and not a personal check? Um, you know, it, it kind of depends on your seller in that transaction, because if you, if the listing agent or the seller is going to have us hold on to the funds until we close, which again is what I suggest you guys do, then it doesn't really matter how they send us the funds. Um, more so on the listing agent side, it would be important if you have a client who is going to want us to write the check to them for the option money, that you convey that information to the buyer's agent in advance, because otherwise your client's going to be frustrated that we're not able to release the funds yet. Okay, and then it looks like the forms aren't in zip forms yet. They're only on Trex website. All right. Well, I appreciate you guys spending time with us today. Um, if you have any questions and you wanna send stuff to me, I'm Latra, Texas National Title. Um, my phone number is 512-317-3646. Our amazing sales rep team, they know where to find me they can definitely send over any information. Um, I'll type my email address in the chat box as well. I got you done already later. I put that oh, in the chat. Um, perfect. Thank you all for joining us. And um, as a couple of reminders, do not forget to download the Zocam app, Z as in zebra, O-C-C-A-M. And Texas National Title also has a brand new app called the Companion app that will allow you to do net sheets. So we encourage you to check both of those out and reach out to your sales rep if you have questions. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Latra.